children, I guess you can be dismissed for junior church. And can you do me a favor? Uh, can you stand with me? And if you know this, ver- uh, know this prayer, would you pray this with me? The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debted against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may have your seat. You may be seated. God is a is a holy God. We see that throughout Scripture. There's a whole book of Leviticus that speaks of God's holiness and the standards of his holiness. And it's interesting that that Lord's Prayer begins with a, uh, an introduction, and then it has a conclusion, but in the middle are a series of petitions. And the very first petition there is, Hallowed be your name. Let your name be hallowed. And it's a petition. It's not a statement of fact initially, because if it were, Jesus would have said, hallowed is your name. But he said, hallowed be your name. Among his people, he wants his name to be hallowed. He wants his name to be reverenced. He wants his name to be exalted. He wants his name to be revered, because God is a holy God. Uh, We, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, are called to be holy as well. In 2 Corinthians 6, it says, Therefore go out from their midst and be separated from them, says the Lord, touch no unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. That God is calling us to come out of this world and to be different, to be set apart. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says this, Strive for the peace with everyone and for the holiness, for without it no one will see the Lord. So God calls us to be holy. And when you think about holiness, it's interesting that if you were to ask most people what the word holy means, they probably would say purity or uh, moral purity or some type of righteousness, which is true, but that's only a secondary definition in Scripture. The primary definition in Scripture for holiness is something that is separate, different, distinct, other. See, God is viewed as other, and there's theologians call that God's transcendence. He is different from us. He's above us. He is separate from us. Uh, author R.C. Sproul wrote this book that I read probably two or three decades ago, and it was called The Holiness of God. And when I read the book, I had never heard of R.C. Sproul before. And when I read the book and then watched a series of his lectures on it, it captivated me about the holiness of God, how important it is that we revere him, that that God does something. He makes something sacred, and he makes something holy just by the touch of his hand. What was ordinary before, because God touched it, it has now become extraordinary. It's been set apart. God set apart that thing or those people with distinction to be holy. The chairs that we sit on today could have been chairs in a secular place, but they were placed here in this sanctuary, and now they've been set apart for the glory of God. The microphones, the lights, this pulpit, I mean, all these things, and you have been placed here to be separated in the name of God. Now, I said Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. God is very strong for his name. He wants his name to be revered. He wants his name to be exalted. Hallowed be your name. You know, one of the things that we could see with the name of God is how we see God, how we view God, how we reverence him or not. You know, sad to say today, we live in a culture that takes the name of God so easily, flippantly, cavalier, off their tongues. They just say these words today, oh my, all these phrases today where the name of God is exalted. The name of God is cursed today, over and over and over again. 
God is so desirous that his name be hallowed, he gave you a commandment that says, do not take the name of the Lord God in vain. It's interesting, years ago, I was doing this study of the Ten Commandments, and I said, well, I've got that one. I don't use those kind of language, right? I don't say those curse words. But then I started to think, it's not just the prohibition about taking God's name in vain in a curse. It's the fact that James is a Christian, and he's been labeled a Christian, and if I do things that are outside of God and people can see that, I could be taking the name of the Lord God in vain. How many ways do I compromise? How many ways do I demean God's name through my life? And how many ways do you? I want you to talk, I want you to think today about a church that compromised. This church is going to get some commendations from the Lord Jesus Christ, and the church is going to have some really great things that they've done, but this church as well is going to be a church that has slowly but surely compromised with the culture that's around them. And then the culture not only invaded them as a body, then started to invade them individually, and it was starting to have an impact in our lives. And by doing so, they were not reverencing and honoring the hallowed name of God. Let's look here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 through 17, and we are in our third church. The third church is the church at Pergamum. It says this, verse 12, and to the angel, the church of Pergamum, write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny faith, even though in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there that hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the uh, sons of Israel so that they may eat food sacrificed to idols and practice immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone with a new name written on it on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Well, this is God's sufficient, eternal, authoritative, life-giving, and life-changing word. All right, my outline is pretty simple today. We are going to look at the church, the city, and Christ. Um, as Pastor Doug did, I think, in his first message on the letters, he kind of laid out that each one of these letters has about six or seven um, steps to it. We're going to have some of those same things here. So we're going to talk about the church, we're going to talk about the city, and we're going to talk about Christ's distinction. What Christ did was the distinction that he showed himself in chapter 1 and uh, in chapters 1, he is now going to show that to that particular church. And the two-edged sword, if you remember, came from chapter 1. He's going to use that identification of himself. The second is we're going to look at the commendation. What did Jesus say that they did well? commendation. Then we're going to look at the confrontation. What are they in danger of? And what's the threat that is hurting that church? And I need you to hear that threat because I think that's a threat that we in our culture are dealing with. Then he has a choice. They have a choice before them. Based on what Christ has said, what's the choice that you're going to do? And then finally, he ends with this promise of, of his compassion and his comfort. So well, let's start with the church, the city, and Christ. Well, the church is in the city of Pergamum, and Pergamum is this deeply pagan city. So we had Ephesus, we had Smyrna, and now we have Pergamum. And Pergamum was about 55 miles north, I believe, of Smyrna. And Pergamum was considered a, uh, the city of the gods, or a citadel of the gods. Uh, there was a famous library there that had 200 thousand volumes there and incredible volumes. But, but what the city was mostly known for was its pagan worship. They had a temple to Zeus, they had a temple to Athena, Apollos, and they had a series of other temples. They also had um, 
emperor worship as well. They, um, uh, they had a temple to Caesar Augustus, and they had a temple to Domitian. And so this place was heavily pagan, and that's what this church was. There was a large, um, above the city, I think a thousand feet above the city, was this uh, temple, uh, this Acropolis in Pergamum. So as you lived in that city, it was heavily pagan. Now, the thing about it was, it wasn't just the religious activity, it was the economic activity of that culture was really saturated around that religious worship. So it wasn't just that I could reject this pagan worship, but it was also involving the economy of the day. Now, apparently what had happened was this. There was some persecution that had come into the area, and it seems as though this persecution is gone now. And one of the persecutions, uh, one of their members was killed. We'll talk to, about him in a moment. Uh, anything else I want to tell you about this? I think that's about it when you think about the city and the church itself. So this church is there living in this pagan area. I was trying to think, you know, we're out here in Warren County, right? White, white um, Warren County of um, New Jersey. I, I was thinking maybe it's a church like in New York City or a church like in Los Angeles, you know, or a church in some major city where there's a lot of struggles that are happening around. And to be a God-honoring church in Warren, New Jersey, is a lot easier than maybe being a God-honoring church in the midst of the city. And so I want you to think about that. Well, church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was there in that city. Now, Jesus calls himself the sharp two-edged sword. Now, we talked about this in the first chapter. Now, this could be the word of God. And if you're familiar with Hebrews chapter four, uh, four it talks about the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit. What, what a sword does is it pierces and it separates. I was thinking about this. I've had 11 surgeries in my life, and a person could take a scalpel, and when they take that scalpel and they cut you, they can cut you to bring healing or they can cut you to bring harm. Well, this, this two-edged sword is one that brings healing in your life, but it can also bring some level of destruction and judgment. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. So, Jesus Christ is to this church, to the city, and to Jesus Christ. Let's now look at the commendation, verse 13. Verse 13 says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. You did not deny my faith, even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. I want to start with these two first words, I know. You know, you can know information, you can know facts, you can know, um, have an understanding of things, but what Jesus Christ is saying is this, I know you. He is an omniscient God. He knows everything about you. Jesus Christ is aware. When you're sitting here in the sanctuary and maybe somebody doesn't know your name, doesn't know the struggles, doesn't know the difficulties that you're going through, I can tell you on the authority of God's word that God knows that's just such great comfort to me that God is omniscient. He is aware. He knows what you're going through. He knows you. He knows the difficulties. He knows the dangers. He knows you. You are not alone. That should bring you just such great comfort. And he says this, not only do I know, but I know where you dwell. And how does he define where they dwell? He says that you dwell where Satan's throne is. What he's saying is this, that a lot of people think that Satan is in hell, right? But hell is Satan's eternal abode, he's going to be imprisoned in hell for all of eternity. Satan is this God of this world, and he has been given some authority in this world today. And so this God of this world is now influencing the world culture that it's around. And Jesus is saying this, God knows the pressures that you're under. You can see that right here in verse 13. He says, I know where you're living. I know where Satan is dwelling. He also knows the persecutions that you're going through. My faithful Antipas was a faithful witness who was killed among you. It says that he was killed in a bronze um, um, pool or whatever it was in the midst of this persecution. So it was just terrible persecution that he endured. And so what Jesus is saying is this, I know the pressures that you're under. I know the persecution that you face. I know the provocations that you're dealing with, the temptations that you're dealing with, the world that you're dealing with today. I know. 
The major temptation that the people of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament and the people of God today have to deal with is idolatry and immorality. Idolatry is elevating something that other than God and immorality is an unfaithfulness to God in some way or another. Well, Pergamum was in a really difficult situation. They very were. This prominent city was located in a Roman capital. The strong imperial presence and the strain on this Christian church was heavy. And the Roman Empire was there and the Christians were at risk. Maybe you feel that way today. And the pressure is just so heavy upon them. And they didn't succumb when it came to denying their faith. Jesus said, here, you hold fast my name. You know, what would happen in those times is that you would have to bow down in emperor worship. And if you didn't bow down in emperor worship, you could be killed. And they said, I'm not going to hold, I'm going to hold fast to the name of God. God's name is going to be hallowed, at least off my lips. They were a confessing church. They were faithfully proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ, and they did not deny Christ. Well, I think that would be like most of us here. So that's the commendation. Let's look at the confrontation, verses 14 through 15. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrificed to idols, and practice sexual immorality. Their problem was that the world was coming in and worldly teaching was coming into the church and sexual impurity was coming into the church. Sometimes, as Christians, we face external pressures, and sometimes in the church we face internal pressures. External pressures from the world, but then what happens if the world starts to seep inside the church? Then you'll face the pressures from within. Now, this story, if you know your Old Testament, this story of Balaam and Balak is from Numbers chapter 22, verses uh, chapter 22 through chapter 24. I'm not going to take time to go through it. What I'll ask you to do is to read it, but let me just give you a high level summary. Balak is the king, he's king of Moab, and he hates the people of God. So what he does is he calls Balaam in, who is a prophet of that time, and he says, I want you to come and curse the people of God. Well, Balaam says that I need to go to God and ask if I can curse the people of God, which sounds so stupid, I mean, I'm just crazy. But I'm going to go and ask God, and God says, no, you're not going to curse my people. So then he goes back and says, I can't do that. Now, Balak, the king, says, it's always got to be money, so I'm going to give you more money. He sends more people, more money, and he says, do this for me. Now, Balak gets in on a horse. It's a funny story, very honestly. He's going to get on his donkey, and he's going to go on the donkey, and then all of a sudden the donkey stops. The donkey stops. Why? Because the angel of the Lord is standing before Balaam, ready to kill him. And Balaam is so mad at his donkey, hits the donkey three times. And then finally, the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, he opens a donkey's mouth to speak to this moron, I guess. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but it's true, huh? And so you, you know how close you were to dying. And then he says, I want you to go. And I want you to only pronounce what I tell you to pronounce. Four occasions, Balaam pronounces a, cur I mean, pronounces a blessing when he was supposed to curse the people. The frontal assault did not work with the people of God. They weren't going to deny their faith. So then what we find, if you jump to Numbers chapter 31, that the people of God felt a sexual immorality because the women of Moab came in, seduced the men, and then the men fell to idolatry and immorality. And that all came from Balaam. Satan tries to use a frontal assault with you, and sometimes you will not deny him. But then sometimes he'll come in covertly. That's the reason why Jesus uses this story here. He's saying that Satan has come against you to try to attack you, and even Antipas was willing to die for my faith, and you did not go against my name. But now... Immorality comes into the church. Idolatry comes into the church. Heresy comes into the church. And the people are starting to yield to that. He talks here in verse 15, so also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. 
something. We, we're not sure of what it is. So many different commentaries. It could be a heavy-handed le leadership. One commentary says Nico means power, laity uh, means laity, power over the people. I'm not completely sure. But what we can see is this. Whether it's Balaam, whether it's the uh, sin of Balaam and Balak, or the Nicolotians, what it is is that they're compromising. Now, compromising sometimes is good. When you're having a conflict with somebody, you give up certain things for the benefit of repairing that relationship. Sometimes that's good, but what happens here is this. When you're lowering the standard of God, which you do not have the right to do, when you're compromising on the word of God, which you do not have the right to do, you're compromising with the world, and that's what they were in danger of doing. Throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites found themselves making alliances with pagan nations. And as they made these alliances, they believed that they were going to receive help and security from the pagan nation. So if they started to believe what the pagan nation said, they followed it over and over again. And God said throughout the Old Testament, do not make these alliances. Do not compromise. Even in the midst of fearful situations, I want you to know, don't look to the creature, but look to the creator. But when you go through tough times and when I go through tough times, we have a tendency to put our confidence in anyone or anything but God. And I can tell you this, that if you compromise, you won't win. So God says, don't change my message. Don't do what they say. I've given you a message. Proclaim it. Live it. God says, don't agree with the world and encourage an alliance. Don't agree with the world what they call is correct and true. I've given you the truth. Don't believe the world's lies. Don't be flattered by the world. Do not compromise. But we do. It's interesting that, uh, you know, today we have this tendency, revisionist history, Right? We go back and look and say, how could leaders of the United States be Christian and do some of the terrible things that they did? How could we in the United States enslave my family members? How could we do that here in the United States? How could somebody sit in a worship service on a Sunday morning but be a slaveholder? And so we say they couldn't be Christian. But I ask you, if 150 to 200 years from now, if, if Christ tarries, when they look back at 2022 and they look at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, what would they say that we've compromised on? You know, as, as evil as abortion is, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been slow to speak against it. And homosexuality and other sins like that are terrible, heinous, but we have a tendency, let's be honest, to magnify those sins and kind of wink at our own. One of my favorite authors, Jerry Bridges, wrote a book, Respectable Sins. And he listed off a number of sins that we, as people, tend to compromise on. I want you to think about this list. This is not trying to hurt anybody. I just want you to think about this, because as I was reading this list, and I reminded myself of this book, it was like, James, how many of these do you find yourself compromising on? Ungodliness, anxiety, worry, frustration, discontentment, unthankfulness, pride, selfishness. A lack of self-control over your eating. Ooh. A lack of self-control over your finances. A lack of self-control over your words out of your mouth. Your judgmentalism, your impatience. See, these are things that we wink at and they seem like they're not big. The big sins are those things that we speak against. And, and God says, I hate all of this. And we as a Christian church need to be very careful that we're not compromising on these areas and elevating somebody else's sins. How are people going to look at us 150 years from now? Sin is interesting because it disturbs every relationship that you have. It disturbs your relationship with God. It disturbs your relationship with each other. It disturbs your relationship with, his, with um, nature. 
Sin attacks everyone at birth. Before it's done, it degrades, it disbases, it destroys an eternal hell. Every broken marriage, every disrupted home, every shattered friendship, every argument, every disagreement, every pain, every te tear is attributed to sin. Sin is a cursed thing. Sin deceives us, it distracts us, it divides us, it destroys us, and we wink at it. And we focus on the sins of others. We fail to recognize the sins of our own lives. And Jesus is saying to this people, be very careful. We have these three mortal enemies. He talks here about Satan, and he's a major enemy, but we have the world system that's around us, this world system that you and I have a tendency to take in. How many times as you watch a TV program or watch a movie that you sit in, and you see such godless things go on, how many times do you get up and walk out? I mean, I, I was torn by this when I started to think about this. How many things have you allowed your eyes to see? How many things have you allowed your ears to hear that if Christ were sitting right here with you, you would, you would turn it off immediately? Well, he is sitting right here with you. He is in you, and he hates it. And we've compromised with the world. That sin that is in the world, and then there's Satan. Satan is your greatest enemy. Satan is your worst enemy. He is tireless in his, in his defeat for you. He is a deceiver. He wants to deceive everyone that is around. He wants to punish you. He wants to take you out. He knows he can't take your salvation away, but what he wants to do is to distract you, to deceive you, to disgrace you, to destroy you. He wants you to think wrongly, believe wrongly, feel badly so that you will act sinfully. That's what Satan does. There's a world system that's around, then there's Satan, and then there's your flesh, your internal, your internal flesh that hates God. You sit in a worship service ready to fall asleep. Turn on the football game later or baseball game later, wide awake. Because your flesh is at war against you. When you're up there at night opening your Bible and trying to read it, can't get anything out of it. But you can op turn on the TV and you can just take in over and over again because your flesh hates you. Be very, very, comp be very aware that you have an enemy in the world. You have an enemy in Satan. You have an enemy within. So this church, in the midst of this pagan city, had stood against the frontal assault, and they were commended. They did not reject their faith, but they failed on the internal, and they were confronted because they had given in to sin. Now there's a choice, verse 16. He says, therefore repent. Repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus Christ is talking about that sword, and he says, I need you to repent. I have exposed before you, don't worry about the sins of the world. We always talk about trying to transform the world. The Bible never talks about transforming the world. It talks about transforming people, and your lives be transformed. You, as an individual in Christ, need to be transformed. And when you do that, then you could be a light in the world. You can't get rid of a president and all of a sudden you're going to get righteousness in this world. Trust me, it's not going to work. There is only one that is going to redeem. There's only one that's going to forgive and set us free. We sang about him this morning. It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the choice is to repent. Repent is interesting. The Bible talks about it as confession, and it means change. Change of mind, the thoughts, change of desires, and then a change of will. Proverbs tells us that there are two strategies when it comes to repenting. You will either, or two strategies when it comes to sin. You will either confess your sins or you will conceal your sins. He who conceals his sin will not prosper, Proverbs 28, 13. Or whoever confesses it finds mercy and grace. We need to confess. We need to come to a place where we see our sin and confess it. And then we go to Christ's cross and ask him for our, his forgiveness and plead his blood upon us and, and stand before him as my faithful one, my forgiving one, my one who sets me free. But if you don't, 
Some of you sit here and you've heard this before, and some of you have never trusted in Lord Jesus Christ. And he says there's a two-edged sword. Remember that scalpel that could be used to bring healing in a surgery? That same scalpel can wound you in amazing ways. And Jesus Christ came, you know, I was talking to someone recently, and they said, oh, Jesus is just love. He doesn't worry about sin. And it's like, I don't know who you're looking at. Jesus Christ died on a cross for sin. If he winked at it, why would he need to die? He died for you. He is a holy, holy, holy God. And you will either trust him as Savior or you will be judged by him in eternity. So the choice is there for the church. Repent. Lastly, Christ's promise. I love this in verse 17. So now he's talked about this church and the city. He's talked about the struggles that they've gone through. He talked about the commendation that he's given them, the, con the confrontation. He says the choice, and then he says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. There's a call to hear. And what he's saying is this, I need you to hear me here. Listen. And if you've been given an ear through regeneration, through God's work in your life, then hear what he is saying to you. Hear him. But then he says to the one who overcomes, conquerors, that you're going to battle the persecutions. You're going to battle the pressures. You're going to battle the provocations day after day in your life. Overcome, overcome, overcome. Christ is the great overcomer. He wants to overcome through you. For Jesus Christ says, I've been, well, God says, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave his life for me, that Jesus lives in you to forgive you, but Jesus lives in you to set you free. So, you're a conqueror. And then he gives these three promises. He says, manna, a white stone, and a new name. I think ultimately these are about Christ. The manna, if you remember, was manna in the Old Testament, and they needed food, and God gave them this manna every day, and they would take this manna in, and it was a physical nourishment. And Jesus used that illustration in John, and he says, I am the bread of life. So Jesus Christ is the manna that we need to turn to. The white stone here, the stone of purity, the stone of victory, the stone of acquittal is Jesus Christ for you. And the new name, the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And by that name is the name that will save those that trust in him. So Jesus Christ is the manna. He's the white stone. He's the new name. But for you, as a believer, this hidden manna is this, this hidden principle that God wants to work in your life. Ed Welsh, in his book, Running Scared, um, he talked about this manna principle. He talked about the fact that God hears you in the midst of your struggles. And not only does God hear you, but he delivers you. He gives you the manna that you need. God will test you, because day after day, he says, I'm only going to give you enough manna for today. Will you trust me today? And God is a God who is so amazingly gracious, abundantly gracious, grace upon grace to you. What an amazing thing. When I was thinking about this man, I was thinking about Psalm 23. Instead of worshiping at the pagan temples and eating their banquets, Jesus said this, I prepare a table before you in the presence of mine enemies. He's the hidden manna. He's also the white stone, and he's given that to you. The white stone was interesting. It was either a ticket into an event, you could give a white stone as a ticket into an event, or... It was a victor, a victor at the end of a race would receive a white stone, or there was a third way that that white stone was used. It was an acquittal in a court. So if you got a black stone, 
you were guilty, but if you got a white stone, guess what? You're acquitted. You're not guilty. I don't know which one of those three are right, admission, victory, or acquittal. I think all three are there when we think of the gospel. Jesus Christ has given you admission into heaven through his precious blood. Jesus Christ is the victorious one over sin, and therefore he has given you the ability to be victorious over sin, and he has acquitted you. You are not guilty in his sight if you trust in him. Manna, stone, new name. We've got this, uh, when you are adopted into a family, you're given a name. You're given the family name. When we were adopted into the family of God, we were given a new name. That new name gives you an identity. That new name gives you security. That new name is yours. You are a Christian, a little Christ, a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are forgiven and set free. The world around you is pagan. They're going to press you. They're going to provoke you. They are going to maybe even persecute you. Know that. That's coming. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the two-edged sword who can bring healing in your life if you trust him and his word. I want you to hear the commendation. Don't forsake the name. Hallowed be your name. Be very careful of the confrontation that don't yield to idolatry or immorality of this world because it will not set you free. You have a choice when you have failed, and all of us, when I gave you that list, I looked at that list this morning I gave myself, I, I saw so many areas of sin that I needed to confess. If you see them, confess and run to Christ and know that he has forgiven you. And remind yourself of the precious promises. He's manna. He's a white stone. He is your hope today because he's given you a new name a new identity, Christian. Let's pray. Father, we have this terrible tendency, and I, I, we're all here, and we're living in a world that's really confused and really chaotic, and the things that are happening around this world seem like they're running headlong to hell. And we look and we say, this is crazy in my lifetime. I can't believe these things that are happening. And we have a tendency to look outside rather than inside. Father, you want your name to be hallowed not only out of our lips, but in our hearts. So, Father, help us to be very careful not to compromise. Compromise on our own respectable sins. And help us to know that all sin is heinous to you. And Father, when we do see that sin in our lives, help us not to get hopeless. Help us to turn to the one who is our only hope, the one who is our only healing, the one who set us free. For those that are here that have never trusted in your son today, Father, I pray that they would not only see their sin, but see their impossibility of dealing with it on their own. And I pray that they would run to the only one that can, your son, the gospel, his grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We've got a busy morning this morning, and today we are going to end our morning with the Lord's Supper, the communion table. The communion is a celebration of God's grace. It's not about human achievement. It's not about what we do. It's about what Christ has done for you. It's not an end in it itself. It's a celebration of the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, his covenant faithfulness to you. You were faithless, but he became faithful because he did not deny himself. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died a death for those that believe in him. For all of those that will ever trust in him, his sacrifice will be attributed to you and you could be set free. He's given you this covenantal sign of this relationship and it's this cup and this bread. Now the cup and the bread, some places teach that Christ is being re-crucified again. He's not. He died once for sin. But when we take this cup and we take this bread, we remind ourselves of what Christ did for us. His broken body, his shed blood, for you. Now here at the chapel, we have our cup and there are two cups. So you'll see a, a lower cup with the cracker in it or the wafer in it. And then you'll have the upper cup that will have the juice. Uh, hold on to those. The 
ushers will hand those out to you, hold on to them, and then we'll have you prayed over. Also here at the chapel, you don't have to be a member of the chapel at Warren Valley to take this cup or this bread. You need to be a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are, take it, worship God, and praise him because he has forgiven you and set you free. Amen. Thank you.